welcome now our first plenary session. And uh, for that, please welcome our speakers, Marie Doha Besancenot, Hernan Craviez, Xavier Lepine, Eric Stalmer, and this panel will be moderated by Pierce Cumberledge, who uh, has an impressive global career mixing entrepreneurship, big companies, and also NGO and commitment with the organization, again, to put people and human beings at the center. Please, Pierce, over to you. Thanks so much, Leila. And it's great to see you all here today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really pleased that we've got a super panel here. We're going to be talking about a fascinating subject. We're here in the 21st century, and we're going to be talking about two of the great themes of this century, sustainability and diversity. But we're going to be talking about those in the context of the communities that we all live in. And those communities can be very large, they can be big cities, they can be nation states, they can be small villages and rural communities, they can even be, nowadays, helped by technology, transverse communities. Airbnb is a global community, even though it transcends a whole number of different borders. So, what I'd like to do is I'm going to have this great panel with me now explore some of the issues about sustainability and diversity in those 21st century communities. I'm going to start off here with Xavier Lepine from La Française, who's going to give us the big picture. Xavier. You're an investor, you're a long-term investor, and you're therefore looking and saying, how am I going to make great investments in the 21st century? What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> when you look at what was uh, our global core for the last 20 years, it was globalization. Everything was organized for globalization, corporates, uh, to, uh, international treaties, and so on. It has been a wonderful world. Really wonderful. All of us, we were making money. Uh, one billion inhabitants were not starving anymore. And uh, let's say that 300 million people in developed countries have more difficulties than in the past. This is the third generation who, has, who is getting less than the previous one. But more important than that is that I, I was at the uh, um, last summer at the uh, employer and unions uh, event. There was three topics. Three topics were inequalities, global warming, conflict, what's the future of capitalism? And not what's the future of, the, uh, of uh, everything else, of capitalism. And it's very interesting because when you consider the first problem, inequalities, it's a problem of democracy. If you take a uh, 40 years career for someone, so the last 40 years, inflation was 350%. Increase of minimum, minimum wage was 400%. So what's the matter? The matter is that developed countries have supported the, uh, the big move of globalization with a uh, helicopter of money, very, very long term, uh, very, very low interest rates, and deficits. The result of that is that a lot of money has been put into the system. Today, you have to put, enfin, 40 years ago, when you were putting one dollar into the system, you were creating one dollar of GDP. Today, it requires five dollars. But all this money is going somewhere. It's going into real estate and financial assets. In large cities, because of urbanization, the increase of uh, flat, let's say Paris, for example, has been multiplied by 14, while the salaries were increasing by four. Is it affordable? Is it sustainable? Same problem with equities. The MSCI global total return has increased by 33. So, an increase of uh, inequalities. And when a democracy is not protecting the, mi the minority, you have its questioning democracy. And then you have the yellow vest in France, the Brexit in England, in, uh, in the UK, the 5,000 in Italy, and maybe Trump in the uh, US. 
That's the first issue. Second issue is global warming. Global warming is an interesting case because it's not new, but it's a problem of discounted rate. When you were back in uh, 2000, you were saying, well, it will be too warm in 2100. You discount that risk at 5%, it's worth zero. You are a politician, you don't care. You are an industrial, industrial you have a five years medium term plan, you don't care about what is happening in 100 years. So no value at all. The good thing, or well, the thing is, today we are in 2020, and what uh, the specialists and the uh, GX tell us, that the problem is not in 2100, it's in 2030. So the, with the same discount rate, it has a lot of value. And you see that everyone is questioning global warming. And then, why? The answer is very clear. It's also a problem of democracy. All of us, we know that human beings cannot survive with 45 degrees and 65% of humidity. What will happen in 2030 is that a part of the world, which is very crowded today, will be in that case. So when we have already problem of one of 1,500 migrants coming into Europe and it requires three countries to absorb them, if it comes to 10 million people, then democracy is questioned. And where it becomes very important for investors is that countries will react, governments will react, and we will have to reduce inequalities and carbon issues. They will put some norms, they will put some regulations. If we have to reduce the uh, issue of CO2 by 80%, we will have to transform a lot of our industries. So investing, investing, investing. And that's where the opportunity comes for investors. Xavier, thanks so much for that. That's it's a really big picture and it raises, raises some interesting points. I mean, you're really focusing in on inequalities. You're focusing in on global warming. I mean, this is the whole sustainability piece too. Hernan, can I move to you? Hernan Kravietz of Norman Foster Foundation. We know Norman Foster, an architect who makes iconic buildings. But what does the foundation do? I think the foundation has got an interesting story. Hannon, tell us about that and tell us about this built environment that you focus on as opposed to the economic environment that Xavier is focusing on. Thank you, Piers. Uh, well, I'll answer giving you maybe a broad picture of what the foundation does. Uh, starting, obviously, you introduced Norman Foster and the foundation holds the Norman Foster archive and uh, Norman has been pioneering this uh, sort called green architecture, you know, sustainable architecture since his early days in the 60s. Uh, so even before it became a, a term, you know, green architecture. And that is, is seen throughout the archive that it's uh, uh, held at the foundation and it's a massive source of uh, uh, educational source for future generations. Uh, the main aim of the foundation is, is, is to, to generate awareness of all of these problems that you are, are commenting on and, and promote interdisciplinary thinking to help the younger generation of architects, of designers, of urban planners, uh, of engineers, of civic leaders to be able to face these problems in a better way. So how do we do it? We do it with a, a strong educational program. Uh, these, we have strong links with, uh, with most of the top universities around the world and students come to do research, experimental uh, uh, projects on different themes like mobility, like cities, like digital technologies, like robotics. Um, and uh, uh, not only that, we also, because we like doing things, we also have projects. And I think there's, there's some images uh, up on the screen. Uh, the foundation is based in Madrid but we operate globally and we have uh, projects in different parts of the world and there are projects that are aimed at, at mainly uh, social and humanitarian uh, aspects but also uh, uh, in terms of research of new technologies and, and new ways of how to basically try to tackle uh, all of the current issues. But Hernan, what is a project? Is so, a project a city? Is a project a house? The projects are, are, well, we have a wide range of projects. It goes through 
uh, research on new farming technologies, urban farming technologies. Uh, we do projects that are, uh, 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 for instance, a new uh, digital uh, civic centers in Mexico, in communities that are isolated in Mexico, and we produce those. I think you can see now up on the screen some of them. Uh, we are uh, collaborating also uh, for a fantastic project on new ways of mobility systems, urban mobility systems that will integrate other services, not just mobility. Uh, and probably our largest project at the moment and most important is working with the communities in India, uh, regenerating what are called slums, informal settlements, regenerating them from within rather than doing the, what's been the norm for many, many years, which is bulldozing these communities and building, uh, uh, I would say, alien kind of uh, uh, blocks, building blocks somewhere else for these communities to relocate. This is working with the communities, regenerating uh, these settlements from within, working with the communities. We're getting a really interesting theme coming out here. We had Xavier, the, really the person deploying capital, but also very sensitive to the sustainability. We have here Norman Foster, big buildings in city centers, iconic parts of the economic hubs of capital, Lower Manhattan, London City, and so on, but also doing work on sustainable developments in India. That's, that's an interesting theme coming out, and I'd like to move it from the macro we've looked at here through that on-the-ground built environment and come to Marie Doha Besancenot from Alliance, Mary Doha is looking at a different community. Mary Doha is focused on the, the company as the community. What is that group of employees? That is a community. And what are the issues there now? Is that just an economic community generating value for shareholders? Or is there something else happening there? Mary Doha. No, thank you. I think um, all the topics we just mentioned being, be it inequalities or let's call it social justice, let's call it um, environment. All those topics are, I guess the big thing today is that they're not political anymore, they're beyond political. They're federating um, topics and our employees, and I would say this is the big change, no longer want to be just employees and relate to work as a place to work, but they also bring in their beliefs as citizens and sometimes as activists, you never know, you know, they may spend their weekend fighting with uh, Extension Rebellion or, you know, they um, no longer want to be conflicted between their individual beliefs, whatever they do on weekends, whatever they've done in their previous life possibly, and uh, what they work for on a daily basis. And this we need to acknowledge it, and that means shifting maybe a little bit our gaze on our employee uh, basis. And also provide space for debate, provide space for expression of those needs. Um, but then I would also say, it means a little bit of work from the, from the leaders of the company to provide a, a framework because it is a time of uncertainties. I mean, Xavier mentioned it. Of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world, be it political, be it environmental. So the company should also provide a reassuring framework and that framework goes with visions, um, you know, a definition of the missions, of the values. And uh, I think the economic leaders should be a bit brave about saying, this is the values of the company, and of course, there's a whole diversity of opinions inside the company, but take the topic of Europe, for example, I think Allianz is a European company, should be able to say we're European, and then organizing a debate inside the company about it, and this is something we did, and I found it really great that people felt free enough to stand up and say they had doubts about it, and um, you know, I think it's absolutely normal that um, our employees reflect the society, so we have people you know, who vote for extremes. We have people who have doubts about a lot of things, but it's also our job and to explain, you know, use a bit of pedagogy. Why is it okay to work for a capitalist company today and not only for an NGO? And why do we believe it's okay to do it with us and why we share those visions? Mary Doha, that's really interesting. I mean, your last piece is there. Essentially what you're saying is that in the days when an employee is, came, put on the uniform and became a corporate animal as they walked in through the door, that's all gone. There's a much more fluid relationship between the personal life and the professional life, and the companies have to think in terms of that new identity, both as a company and the employee identity. Fascinating. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're all sitting comfortably. We're all sitting here, our feet are on the floor. We're really down on planet Earth, and we're talking about communities here on planet Earth and the sustainability of those communities. But I want to take you somewhere else, or I've got someone on the panel who's going to do so. Eric Stolmer, 
Eric, Eric is in charge of space tourism. Eric, the 21st century is when we're going to have people living on Mars. It's the century when we're going to be having communities in space. Take us there, please. Explain to us, what are those communities going to be like? And how are they going to be sustainable? You know, Mars and water, there's a bit of a challenge there. How's this going to work? Go for it. Well, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you that we already have a community in space right now. Right now, living and working, there's six astronauts from around the world on the International Space Station. Just two weeks ago, there was nine as they did a crew change. And this is really the, the uh, embryonic stage, if you will, of building communities in space and living and working in space. And, and what we're learning from the impacts uh, biologically and physically on the body in space is really going to be the stepping stone for what we do later in our future exploration with the moon and the Mar and, and going on to Mars. Um, I, I mentioned yesterday at the conference at Nice that when people asked about, well, when can people go into space? And believe it or not, it's really soon for the general public. When I say really soon, people have been saying that for years. For 50 years, people have been saying that post-Apollo that we'd be there. And I think that that realization, that dream and that goal that we all have um, is, as I said, is, is really right around the corner. And I, I think it's safe for me to say within six months to a year at the most, um, people will be, you know, will have human passengers in space, albeit in low Earth orbit, uh, suborbital and microgravity trips uh, led by Virgin Galactic uh, by Richard Branson's uh, company, um, as well as Jeff Bezos's company, Blue Origin. They're looking to bring the first space tourist, if you will, or commercial astronauts, as we like to call them, uh, into space. And in doing so, they're not just floating around into space for those 10 minutes. There's microgravity research that's taking place. Again, building the stepping stones of what we need to do as we, if we want to build a community into space. Um, I know right now uh, NASA is working very closely with the commercial space industry from a global perspective about putting people back on the moon. Uh, the Artemis program is committed to um, putting the first woman on the moon within the next five years. Um, and then there'll be men there, but uh, so, in, so we don't have to say mankind, we can say humankind uh, now on about the first steps on the moon. So this is an exciting uh, time in the space industry. And the last five years has been a really dynamic time in the breakthroughs in technology and reusable technology and the miniaturization of uh, tools and assets in space. And I can only envision the, the, um, the, the communities that will be built with these stepping stones and the infrastructure that we're investing in now. Eric, that's, that's great. It's, it's, it's very exciting. I mean, I have to say, my wife and I often say we'd love, we'd love to be on that first Mars colony. Um, we think we're a little bit old, but maybe they're going to need some older people as well as all the young ones to help with the governance of it. Can I, can I pick up on that a little bit? How, how, how are you, you know, who owns space? Who owns space? Who governs space? Who's going to run these colonies? What is going to be the rules there? Because in this new 21st century dimension, who, who, who sets... Mary Doha talked about a framework. She talked about a, a comfortable, reassuring framework that leadership of a company needs to set. Who's going to set that comfortable, reassuring framework for space? Well, a, a framework was set up uh, in the height of the Cold War as... as the United States and the Soviet Union were racing to the moon. Uh, countries all over the world signed the uh, Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And that really set the basis of, of a framework of how we live and work into space. Uh, and it was designed with 1967 mindset that we will be going to the moon soon and we will have colonies. And, and we're not there yet. I think that has, we have to do a reset on that because it's not going to be nations that are going to space. It's going to be individuals and corporations as well. And when you look at it from that, you have to look at it from a, gl a global perspective, uh, whether it's uh, SpaceX or from the U.S. or iSpace from Japan. Uh, how are we going to uh, define what the rules of the roads are for sustainability? Um, there's issues with planetary protection um, and the... Uh, I mean, there's, already, there's already satellite junk up there. People there, are trying. We've got swimmers at the moment from Nice to Monaco clearing up plastic junk from the oceans. Who's clearing the junk out in space? Uh, no one is clearing it just yet. Uh, and that is a huge problem. There's 22,000 pieces 
of orbital debris right now in space that we have to track. 22,000. 22,000. And, and that's pieces that we can track that's about the size of a ping pong or, or bigger. So there's probably hundreds of thousands of smaller pieces. Um, but who's going to govern that space traffic management? You know, do we coordinate uh, with, you know, all the different space agencies around the world? And each country is starting their own space agency every day. So it's uh, working with those partners. So this is, this, this is every country working together. People are going to do it, but they're not quite doing it yet. Uh, when, you know, the question is when it's going to happen. I'm, I'm going to move back to Xavier because Xavier is an investor in a new world... Um, to what extent, Xavier, are the investors in you asking you to take a different approach to the management of your investment, the governance of those investments, and particularly to the sustainability, the impact and, uh, of those investments? What's happening now in that space, Xavier? Well, I get that as an asset manager, <clears throat> our mission is a fiduciary mission. And what we have to explain and what we, we explain to the investors is that they cannot do the same as the years before because there will be so many changes in the coming years that the former way to invest, which is based on a global index or... A f well, let's, say, let's take the example. Before, when you want to stay rich, you, you are just investing in bonds. No risk, risk-free. Today, risk-free bonds in most of the countries have negative interest rates. Does it cope with your mission? No. When you want to, in, to uh, not stay rich but become rich, you are investing in equities. Does it make sense to invest in the same assets today when you know that we've, if you believe in what has been said today, which is that there will be major impact due to this, this need of uh, reduction of inequalities and um, and global warming to invest that th the performance of the sectors will be the same. Not at all. You will have winners and losers. Uh, technology is also a strong move. Who was making money in, in uh, 1900? 1900, yeah. Yeah, 1900. It was uh, the guy who was taking uh, care of the horses. Ten years, you were finding a lot of people investing in uh, this type of situation. Ten years later, yeah. cars. So, in other words, as, uh, there's a big move. And the interesting thing for that is that I strongly believe that the, uh, the, uh, it requires a lot of investments and that there will be no issue than, could be, than to keep very low interest rates even if not negative, to do that. So, I mean, j just to conclude briefly, is that we as asset manager, we need to think about the products from the beginning of the products to the end of the products differently. Otherwise, we will not uh, deliver our mission. You talked at the beginning about your fiduciary duty. Um, how much are you driving change as the intermediary between the capital and the projects. How much are you the one who actually says and defines these are going to be the targets, this is where we're going to go? Or how much are you just responding to push from those investors saying, we want you to be investing in more sustainable products? Just a very quick word. Are you the, are you the driver or are you the, uh, the recipient of the, of, of the push for change? I guess that we have to be the driver. Right. That's yeah. clear. You have to be the driver. Herman, Norman Foster, in the work that you're doing, your architectural designs, building a city in India, are you driving change there? Absolutely. Well, that's, that's the idea. And I want to link it to something that uh, Eric said. Uh, it's funny. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a, a strong link between space and communities in India. And actually, the answer to many of the questions are, are exactly the same. Uh, the, develop, the, the development of the technologies that basically are enable, enabling us to go to space and to, you know, eventually set up colonies in space uh, uh, are technologies that are based on autonomous systems, on, uh, on infrastructure that is 
uh, 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 decentralized in infrastructure that basically does not connect to any grid. Uh, and uh, funny enough, the communities that we're working on are communities that do not have access to these services. So the way to do it and what we are uh, working on, obviously together with a range of different uh, people from different disciplines, is including uh, from space, uh, uh, from the space uh, industry, is to try to develop those technologies in order to enable infrastructure uh, uh, which, which helps these communities uh, uh, to get the services without uh, uh, the massive cost of, I mean, not just cost, but obviously inconvenience of what's called, you know, the normal way, the traditional way of building infrastructure. Call it roads, uh, call it sewage, uh, uh, obviously sanitation, uh, energy, etc. So moving away from massively integrated networks into more individual, sustainable, self-contained yes, communities? Yes, but the truth is that whatever happens for these communities that don't have this infrastructure, everything that we're thinking about is obviously sustainable ways of producing this, this uh, uh, infrastructure, and that eventually will come into the larger cities as well. So it's a virtuous circle. Absolutely. Fantastic, fantastic. Mary Doha, people and change. How are you changing your people? We've got very little time left, and I'm just going to very quickly from you, how do you get your people to change? What's your big idea for making them change? So to answer the question, you ask other people, yes, I do believe we need to drive this. Um, and we need to drive it, I would add, with humility, with open ears, because some sort of leadership is expected from us, uh, but then people already have an opinion. They have their own ethics, their own values, so we need to meet in the middle. Uh, and I would say, how do we drive this change? By picking our battles. I would say, not try to do everything at once. And when you're talking about sustainability, you're close to ethics. Ethics is always a dangerous stance. You know, if you claim you're the white dove, then you're easily attacked. So you need to pick your battles and then um, you know, go all the way and be very solutions oriented. And I think we should, really should be because environment is not a political or ideological issue anymore. It has to be solutions oriented. And we can provide many different things inside a company. So there's been a lot of debates about the purpose, companies defining their purpose. I think this works, and I'm a strong believer in this, in this work, defining it and going all the way, saying, um, let's be uh, consistent. If this means that we need to renounce part of the business, you know, why not? <laughs> I'm not advocating this, but then you need to show you're consistent in what you do. Another way to do it is um, include your employees in the definition of the strategy, where you're going, you know, as you see the evolution so in democracy. Um, it's very much inclusive, it's very much consultative, um, and it's also being prepared to actually take the lead and help bring your employees along with you, showing them new ways of doing things. Yes, giving them space to express themselves, to yeah. innovate, and showing that we recognize that. Eric, I'm going to come to you. We've got, you've got literally 15 seconds for the big change, big idea you want to see in space. We're driving change at 17,500 miles an hour. We're <laughs> reducing the cost of access to space to democratize space for the general population. And right now, less than 600 people have uh, traveled to space. We hope to double that number in two years and on, then quadruple. On that number, great yeah. dream, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause, please, for my panel here. Thank you all very much indeed. That was really great. Thanks. So much.